understanding of the laws, right? But notice here, what, what does this arrow mean, right? I'm going to fill all this, right? This is my primitive little chart. It's supposed to illustrate what, how the neo-Kantians understand relationships among entities in, all right? Now, if we were just old school moral, you know, moral philosophers trying to understand whether or not laws about euthanasia and abortion should be changed, for example, if we were just, if we were just concerned about intra-human moral issues, if we didn't have to concern ourselves with non-human entities, like we do in this class, then, as Kantians, this would, this would be how we would diagram our understanding of our relationships with one another, okay? Now, what the Kantians are saying is that the human is not just a physical entity, right? Science knows that. Medical science knows a lot more about the physical entity of the human being than, than medical science knew in Kant's days. But Kant is also saying that the human being has a metaphysical status that is undeniable, okay, that we all must come to accept if we think the human being all the way through. There is no way to think the thought, human being, without including within that thought recognition that a human being is an end in itself. Okay? Now, if you are interested in how Kant puts this argument together, we don't have enough time to go over that in this class. All right? But the book you want to read, it's, it's a small book, thankfully. I mean, it's Kant, so it's hard to read. You know, but the Metaphysics of Morals, right? Groundwork for the Metaphysics of Morals. Right? That's the great classic that, you know, that you'll read in, if you took an elementary ethics class. You would read Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill and get an introduction to utilitarianism, and then you'd read some Kant, right? And you'd get an introduction to Kant through reading his, sometimes it's translated as uh, Introduction to the Metaphysics of Morals, sometimes it's called Groundwork for the Metaphysics of Morals. But, remember how I describe the, the neo-Humean story, the neo-Humean description of, of what's going on in ethical reasoning as a story that is kind of centered around Humean moral psychology, right? The neo-Kantians neo reject that whole approach. They might agree that, you know, what, what is loosely called moral psychology can give us some empirical you know, understanding of what's going on, but to, to really achieve normative guidelines, we can't just fall back on psychology, all right? And the story that the neo-Kantians want to offer to us about how moral reasoning proceeds is that they use the term metaphysics of morals. It's not a psychology of morals. It's a metaphysics of morals. Okay? It's very different. Very different approach. And really sometimes the stories are so different that it's, it's not... I would discourage you from thinking of them as right or wrong. Right? This one is right. They're just very different stories. And depending on how you know, depending on, on how you turn your analysis, you might find yourself, you know, using once moving effortlessly between these two stories. Part of what part of your ongoing assignment is to slow down your own moral reasoning. Right? And when you do that, you'll find that actually the story about moral psychology, about our feelings, right, about how moral judgments are always predicated on feelings, there's some truth to that. And then you'll also find, though, that there's something unsatisfying about that, 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 that the neo-Kantians are onto something, okay? So what do the neo-Kantians say? They say that an understanding of the metaphysical status of the human being leads us inexorably, inevitably, there's no way to escape this conclusion except to retreat back into darkness and stupidity and unenlightenment, right? If you really want to grow up, the Kantians say, right? if you really want to emerge, liberate yourself from your own self-imposed immaturity, then, you, then part of what you have to recognize is that the human being has this special metaphysical status. Okay? And so what Kant calls practical reasoning, which you have to use even just to act, to do anything at all. You have, so there's no, for the Kantian, there's no escaping 
the truth that the human is an end in itself. And so any action which contradicts that truth by doing what? Right? By reducing the human being right, fully to an instrument. Any action which is consistent with the metaphysical truth that the human is an end in itself is going to be morally wrong. Right? And so what, what, what neo-Kantians seem to be arguing, when, 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 a, when, when a thinker who is attracted to this type of argument, okay, about our moral obligations being embedded in our relation, already embedded, right? If we fully understand our relationships with each other, then we have no choice. That's what the Kantians are saying, right? We have no choice but to, but to treat one another as ends in, right? And that's why, and, and the Kantians would say, would, would use this test, for every act, every instance you could imagine of morally wrong action, the Kantians can explain with reference to this model of how somebody here, right, Joe, let's say this is Joe and this is Susan, and if Joe is mistreating Susan, I guarantee you, the neo-Kantians would say, I guarantee you how I can explain how this mistreatment of Susan turns on Joe's instrumentalization of Susan. Okay, that's why it's morally wrong. Sure, Susan is made miserable. She's sobbing and crying, right? And that's one good evidence, a very strong evidence that what Joe is doing is morally wrong. But if we fully understand the moral wrongness of what Joe, you name it, whatever, robbing, let's say he sold Susan a car under false pretenses, right? He put uh, sawdust in the transmission, knowing that the transmission was about to fall out, right? It clunked around, made a horrible noise, right? But once he put that sawdust in there, it ran really smoothly and quietly for 10 miles, right, during the test drive. And Susan really liked the car, and so, anyway, well, how, how does that instrumentalize it? The, the way that it instrumentalized, right, I could have used rape or murder, those are obvious examples, right, reducing Susan, right? But Joe was also reducing Susan by selling her a car that, that he, whose, whose, whose full quality, you know, whose, all of whose properties he hasn't disclosed, right? You have to give the person you're in the relationship with, whatever kind of relation, everyone, everyone you're in relationship with, you have to give the opportunity to exercise their rational decision-making power, right? And if you have concealed essential facts from Susan, then you have instrumentalized her. You see how that works? Okay? So the Kantians think that they have unlocked kind of this, it's really kind of beautiful, really. The more you study Kant, the more you realize that and it's not, you know, Kant is no, no great, you know, it's not any great. He just hit on this, the, this bedrock idea of modern moral philosophy. He did, and other aspects of modern philosophy, right? Uh, and that's why he's such a towering giant. There, there is something to the idea that philosophy has a life of its own. It grows on its own, right? And we study these great thinkers not because there are some kind of great geniuses that stand out and have denied history. No, it's because they are in the flow of history and they are in the flow of the development of ideas. And Kant just happened to capture some of these really, really big, important ideas. He's, you know, there's really no way to understand um, modern philosophy without understanding Kant. So however painful it might be, uh, it's something that needs to be done. All right? Understanding Kant. Uh, all right, so um, I think this page of notes I've already been over several times. Um, so Kantians have a, a good explanation for why humans are morally special. They do. And humans also have an, ex an excellent, and so do utilitarians. So let's go over them real quickly. All right, Kantians say that the whole human, uh, uh, only the human individual possesses a moral personality. And these, oh, sorry. These are the defining features of the uh, of a moral personality: rationality and autonomy. Okay. Um, and these are empirical observations. Okay. That, uh, but they're real simple empirical observations. They're questionable. The only the human individual is rational. How do we know that? We really, you know, we really don't have enough communication with other animals to know. But. On the face of it, it seems plausible. Only the human individual can be held morally culpable. I don't know. You know I like to imagine a future where, where we've had some agreements with, with the cetaceans in the oceans. And they understand. You know, maybe one of them one day, you know, we'll, we'll just turn over a boat. You know, a teen, a, you know, a teenage dolphin or something. A teenager, right? Gets a little too playful, and then 
And his parents have to turn him over, right, to the human authorities because he wrecked their property. <laughs> right? And they put on trial. Like, who knows? If we got communication with them sophisticated enough, then that might be a very might be necessary. Wouldn't it be necessary? If we discover that they that they have a sophisticated understanding uh, like we do, then uh, perhaps that would be appropriate. That would be exciting, wouldn't it? Would they be able to put us on trial? They would, absolutely. If Christopher Stone, well now that, see that goes beyond Christopher Stone. This would be, uh, yeah, Christopher Stone wants to give ecological holes, but probably he would pause and he would be quite attracted to the idea of, of dolphins uh, holding us morally, uh, legally and morally responsible. Uh, through, you know, eventually, man, maybe they fire their own guardian, right? We get the, we get the, the dolphin communication going, right? Just the humans put on some headphones, right? Like they do at the, at the United Nations, right? <laughs> All the ambassadors speak different languages, right? So they have a translator, right? And they wear the headphones anyway. So the humans, if it got that, if, it, if it, we got that, if we became that advanced, then, uh, and, and we agree that the dolphins have a sophisticated, they, they have moral personalities, right? If we, if we have to conclude based on what dolphin scientists have discovered, through sophisticated communication, that then then we would have to uh, give them. And that would be wow, man. And then we would be exposed if we refuse to do that. We'd be exposed. Okay, you guys are just being species centric. You're just being anthro, you know. And that's bigoted, right? If they can communicate and they have rational rationality, autonomy, and moral personality, then there's no other explanation for our prejudices against them other than we're just being an anthropocentric bigots, right? And that's not fair either. We got to get rid of that. Right? We have to be a society of laws, not a society of men. And if it turns out that, anyway, interesting, huh? Andrew, yes. Would there be any danger that, I mean, if that scenario were to come about, that uh, like somebody would take it upon themselves to then like shoot the dolphins so they don't sue us or something, like preemptively, like because they become a threat to people? It's possible. That's where we got to put little uh, body cams on all the dolphins, right? <laughs> they might, you know, who knows, if, if you teach them how to operate a keyboard, they could get on Facebook even. <laughs> they could put a big keyboard underwater there and teach them and they could touch the buttons with their nose. It may be that their intelligence is really beyond ours and that the only reason they haven't manifested a lot of signs of intelligence is because they don't have digits. We have these digits, right? That's a remarkable advantage that we have, along with our minds. Uh, Maybe that, you know, maybe if intelligence really wanted to evolve in the animal world, it should have stuck, you know, with, with the cetaceans and not, you know, kind of took a risk going over there with those primates because, wow, those primates, they can manipulate their environment. You know, those whales, they got those flippers. What can they do? They can't do very much, right, with their flippers. They might think, they might write poems longer than Virgil and Homer, right? They might be reciting epic Greek poems out there. They might have geniuses that understand quantum physics ten times better than Albert Einstein, right? But anyway, yeah. Um, so this is kind of the discussion that like why humans have a moral standing is because they have rationality and autonomy. And is this about like all humans or like people with developmental disabilities? Well, now then you get into some difficult and philosophical who, questions, don't you? Because they still have moral standing in society. They do but they also do not have the capacity to fit that mm -hmm. So, open it. Or a fetus, a human fetus. A human embryo or a human blastocyst. Uh, yeah, so and it, you, there are different explanations of why, uh, for why, for why uh, disabled, developmentally disabled and comatose human beings need to be included in the category entities who have moral status. Uh, there are different explanations for why that would be. Very few people are going to just champion the view that they don't have moral status. You have to be pretty heartless, right, to, to say, well, they just don't have moral status. So why do they have it? And, and, and then the arguments might come down to, they might sound similar to the arguments that, that a Kantian will make about the moral wrongness of kicking a dog or the moral wrongness of, of, of selling your horse who is not that old but a little too old to pull your wagon to a to a glue factory, right? Kant, Kant actually, this would be a cool project to, to rank the great people in history, or just stick with philosophers, rank them according to their relationships with non-human animals. 
some of them are just nightmares, like Descartes. You know, some of these some of these philosophers are just monsters in their in their views of non-human. But Kant evidently was could he would probably get a pretty high ranking, believe it or not. But his arguments for why you shouldn't kick the dog are that it reflects badly on, on, on the human being. You're discarding your own humanity. When you go around, you know, abusing animals, you're discarding your own humanity, and that's why it's morally wrong. Um, um, and so perhaps, you know, one could make a similar claim about discarding the developmentally disabled, right? Uh, you know, or discarding, it, it demeans us, it, it demeans our humanity, and that's why it's morally wrong. And so, indirectly, at least, they have a very strong moral status. Uh, anyway, but obviously, most people aren't comfortable with that either. They want to say there's something special about the human being, damn it, right? Something special about the human being that makes it just totally wrong. It doesn't matter if that human being is developmentally disabled or comatose. It's just super special, because it's human, it's anthropos. Anyway, um, but those are hard questions, you know, and the, the Kantians are hard. They, they have a hard time answering questions like that about, about where our obligations to humans who lack rationality, where do those obligations come from? Um, Milstein, I notice, uses this, this, this term, uh, ethical basis of the land ethic. It's kind of a, an, an awkward term. Uh, I prefer to speak in terms of those three questions. Rather than talking about the moral basis of a, you know, the, the basis of a land ethic, I just want to, I want to, I want to, ex I want each land ethicist to, ex I want to understand how a land ethicist, whichever one we're studying, answers those three questions. The axiological question, the normative question, and the originary question. The originary question is the most attractive one. As William James points out, it's the question that people think once they've answered that, their work is done. Right? But of course it isn't. And the different popular answers to the originary question are conscience, right? That's where moral norms come from. They come from conscience, and of course conscience is endowed by God, right? That's a very traditional answer. To, and then they think, okay, our work is done, right? Right? Conscience, conscience comes from God. Nah, that's all the more moral philosophy. William James points out, wait, wait a minute now, there's a lot more work to be done here. We need to, still got to answer the acts a lot, right? Just telling where moral norm or moral reasoning comes from. That's important, right? But, but there are other questions we have to ask, too. Are you working co on a consequentialist analysis or a non-consequentialist analysis? That, that would be a normative, a key normative distinction. And then axiologically, what is it that you're including in, in the realm of, of things that are morally considerable in themselves, right? So anyway, uh, the originary question is, is just a small part of our work, but it's an interesting question, and, and it's interesting how some kinds of answers to the originary question seem to commit us. As I keep pointing out, that that may be the biggest downfall. It's like a big anchor wrapped around the neo humians neck. If the neo humians want to go forth and be environmentalists and defend the land ethic, then they somehow have to get rid of this consequentialist yoke around their neck, right? This, this habit of thinking that moral reasoning has to emerge because, uh, you know, as thinking about human consequences, right? As long as you think that way, maybe you cannot get over to a more than anthropocentric axiology. You see what I mean? If your answer to the originary question is that moral norms evolve to benefit long-term human interests, right? which would be Darwin's answer. And that's what Milstein is criticizing, right? Milstein is saying, well, you're making a bad move. You're making the wrong move if you, if you think that Leopold is trying to explain our obligations to the land in the same term, right, in sociobiological terms, right? That's just a totally misguided reading of what Leopold is saying. What Leopold really is saying is he is pointing to all of these relationships. These are relationships in the biotic community, okay? And what Leopold is saying, according to Milstein, is that it's an understanding of these relationships, which is achieved, by the way, through science and through human culture. And it's not something that grows genetically, biologically, okay? It's something that exceeds biology. So, right, so the, the Neo-Kantians are saying the emergence of morality is a new thing on this earth, right? It's, it goes beyond, it's, and, and culture, human culture is a new thing. It's 
goes beyond, right? The, the development of culture follows a whole different set of laws than the development of biology, okay? And, if, and, and actually, you know, just thinking, in, thinking about our moral obligations in, Darwinist, in Darwinian terms limits us. Uh, and, and, and limits our, our, our experience of morality. Limits are what, what Thomas Birch, when we read Thomas Birch, he uses this term deontic experience. It means our experience of what we must do, our experience of something that we must do. <coughs> he points out actually that the, the Greeks didn't have a word for duty. And the, and the Greek word deon, which is in deontology, right? The Greek word deon is mistranslated as duty. And what Dion really means is that which one must do. And that's not the same as duty. Interesting, huh? Um, all right. But so Kantians have an easy answer, all right? The most attractive answer for why we ought to treat humans specially. Humans are the only moral agents on earth, all right? And they want to th keep things cut and dry. Classical Kantians just want to keep things cut and dry. Humans are not only the only moral agents, but we are the only ones with rights and the only ones who have any kind of moral status at all. And that means everything else has the status of property, of thingness, right? Being a thing, okay? All other beings are property, come on, right? In the final analysis, sure, we have softer feelings about some of them, right? But in the final analysis, Metaphysically, the only special entity, the only morally special entity is the human individual, okay? Because only the human individual can exercise rationality, okay? And so all these fine distinctions between rights and right, it, it being with rights, being with who is morally considerable, classical humanists just want to say, you know, come on. It, it's either morally considerable or it isn't, and it so happens that humans are the only ones who are morally considerable, and everything else is property. Okay, why, why are humans special according to utilitarians? Um, all right, so take the example of a lifeboat. In the lifeboat, are, are, there's room for five, there, there's only room for 420 pound animals, okay? And in this lifeboat, there are 420 pound humans, and 120 pound dog, all right? For the Kantians, the moral struggle that goes on in that lifeboat is very easily resolved and the dog is thrown overboard, right? Because the dog has no moral personality, the dog is not an end in itself, only the humans are, and so the dog gets thrown overboard, right? For the utilitarians, um, Utilitarians have a different sort of answer, but the utilitarians are going to agree the dog is going to be thrown overboard also, uh, because if a being's moral worth is determined by its capacity to experience pleasure and pain, then we, it seems as though we have to conclude that humans, we don't have to, I mean, Peter Singer disagrees with this, right? Peter Singer wants to say as long as an entity is sentient, then it has moral status. But um, there, th Nevertheless, there seems a glaring hole in utilitarian, uh, because if, if, if your moral status is predicated on your capacity to experience pleasure and pain, it doesn't seem that big of a reach to argue. It seems plausible to argue that animals that have a greater capacity to experience pleasure and pain, because of that greater, have moral, greater moral status. Okay? And it's true, right? Humans are the most social animals. Maybe that's unfair. We're, we're, we're way up there, right? We're very complex. We're aware. Some philosophers, you've heard this, right? That's what, that's what makes humans different. We're aware of our own mortality. It's a tremendous burden to be aware of your mortality. And humans are the only ones who carry that burden, ostensibly, although we know now that that isn't true. Other animals are also aware of their mortality and prepare for their mortality. Um, but, okay, we, we experience loss and grief more profoundly. Therefore, perhaps we have a higher moral status for all these reasons, okay? Humans make more significant moral claims upon other humans than non-humans. Humans have, more, have rights, right? Other animals might be morally considerable, but we have rights. And so, for the utilitarian, as for the Kantian, it's really quite easy to explain that humans deserve preferential treatment and to defend that treatment without just be, being bigots, right? And that's, that's the easy answer, right? They're on my team, right? 
these ones that, that look like this. These animals are on my team. You know, on my, by golly, my team, you know, is number one. And, and that's just, that's a stupid argument. That's not a philosophical argument at all. We're not, we don't care about that. that that's just a dumb argument, right? We want something, and it, but lo and behold, it turns out that, hey, there are plenty of very intelligent arguments. I just showed you, right, how the Kantians and the utilitarians, and then even the Humeans. We've already been over this, really, right? The Humeans also would have no trouble justifying preferential treatment to human beings and justifying uh, human superiority and anthropocentrism, right? Moral sentiments evolve only in relationship with other human beings. Uh, interpersonal relationships are necessary, right, for the emergence of moral sentiments. And interpersonal relationships are necessarily rich, they're thick relationships, right? Sometimes you can have an interpersonal relationship with a non-human animal, right? And that's, you know, like with your dog or your cat or your horse, right? But the human, right, that's the human interpersonal, right, the richness is so much greater. Uh, and that's generally what we talk about when we talk about having obligations. Moral sentiments are emotional and evaluative attitudes, okay? And these are the proto kind of, right, this is what it all breaks down into, okay? Four different kinds of sentiments. Proto-moral sentiments, all right? And the evolutionary historian who wants to explain the emergence of moral norms in human society is, hey, that kind of makes sense. It's kind of a good framework, you know, throw in a little uh, Adam Smith, Somebody was sent me an email about somebody else who, fellow feeling who sent me that email. That was you, uh, that was you, huh? Annabelle, that's right, Annabelle sent me that. Yeah, there, it's, it's an empirical hypothesis, like biophilia, right? Like the existence of fellow feeling, right? I mean, that's something that scientists can go investigate. Does this actually exist? And um, right? the jury's still out, probably. But um, if that's true, Right? And then there is a firm, very firm biological basis for morality. Uh, but self-esteem is a positive moral sentiment regarding ourselves. Guilt is a negative moral sentiment regarding ourselves. Admiration is a more positive moral sentiment regarding others. And contempt and indignation are negative moral sentiments regarding others. Um, and, you know, the idea that, that some neo humans like probably Adam Smith has the most developed form of this, the idea is that there, there is this, right, that the feelings that, that subsist among human beings have a universal, science can go and study them. Um, uh, right? Emotional relations among humans are governed by universal laws, okay, according to Adam Smith. And so an, uh, a Smith, you know, an Adam Smithian biologist or psychologist probably would be better a Smithian psychologist actually uh, proposes to demonstrate that our moral obligations to one another can be demonstrated uh, empirically in our natural, right? They have to say natural, right? Natural human responses exhibit uh, exhibit proto-moral sentiments, and it is out of these proto-moral sentiments that we construct our moral norms. Right, it's kind of cool. Empirically, it, it's, it's a lot more attractive than what the, neo, the neo-Kantians seem to be you know, saying a lot of stuff that we can't demonstrate empirically. Whereas the, the key, key aspects of human moral psychology can all be demonstrated scientifically, which is kind of cool. Um, but they also perhaps commit us to, again, right, this is, remember, Ernest Partridge's claim uh, throughout their four, I know you guys didn't read Ernest Partridge, but he says, in criticizing Collicutt's land, Collicutt's reading of Leopold, Collicutt's land ethic, he concludes that Humean moral psychology is a poor stream, a poor theoretical stream in which to fish for a land ethic. Why? Because human moral, psych human moral psychology answers the originary question the way that the Darwinists answer it, which is that it all, it's all about human beings. And so human moral psychology washes out on, in an anthropocentric moral landscape. Right? Okay? You see how that works? And so we can't construct a land ethic. The best we can do is we can construct an ecologically, environmentally enlightened and well-informed and prudential long-term human interest ethic. Right? But that's not a land ethic. That's just a familiar old ethic that, that's all about humans. 
right, where humans are the only ones with moral status. It's just been fully informed by 21st century science, that's all. You know? Which is good, right? That'd be tremendous uh, progress if we actually were to go that way. But that's still not what many environmentalists seem to be struggling to articulate, right? They're not just struggling to articulate a prudential ethic. They're struggling to articulate an environmental ethic, a full-fledged environmental ethic. So that we can confidently, for example, answer the last man thought experiment, which I haven't introduced yet. But that's the one little thought experiment that environmental ethicists allow themselves to indulge in. Other philosophers indulge in all kinds of other thought experiments. But we don't have to because we have so many moral struggles. All we have to do is look around. And I can throw out a dozen moral struggles to illustrate the philosophical points I'm trying to make, right? But this one little thought experiment way back was very influential. The Australians were involved quite a bit in the uh, emergence of environmental ethics. The Australians and the North Americans, primarily us, us US people and, and the Australians and, and the Canadians. Uh, we'll read Warwick Fox a little bit later. He's a deep ecologist from Australia who's been very influential. But anyway, this other Australian philosopher, environmental ethicist named Richard Rutley came up with this last man thought experiment. And it was his way of, he believed he had, he, through this thought experiment, he could demonstrate that, hum, that, that, that uh, an environmental ethic, a more than anthropocentric, he didn't use those terms in those days, but a more than anthropocentric environmental ethic is necessary to account for, uh, to fully account for our moral responses. <coughs> so he, he imagines a world in which only one human being is is alive. Only one human being is left. In fact, only one sentient. And that one, the only one sentient <coughs> being left in the world is that one human. Okay, and that one human has access, let's say, to a bunch of uh, very destructive weaponry, nuclear weapons and stuff like that. And, and the one human being, the last sentient, there's still lots of plant life, lots of vegetative life, bug life, non-sentient life. Okay, there, there. There are still many non-sentient living beings existing, and they're healthy and thriving. Okay? But all the sentient beings have died for some reason, and the only one sentient being remains, and that's the last human. The question is, is it morally wrong for the last human to detonate a, a, a big bank of nuclear weapons and, 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 and destroy, let's say, destroy uh, all the life in the oceans, let's say? All right? Is it? Anybody want to say that there's, there's nothing morally problematic about the last human being destroying the vegetative life in the, all the oceans? Does anyone want to say there's nothing? Ah, whatever, dude. Come on, raise your hand. Pops would say that. Backwards baseball cap. You got to wear it, right? Say whatever, dude. No. Anyway, I, I tease people a little bit sometimes, but you know, I have tremendous respect for all my, every young person who's getting an education. So. Uh, yeah, you nothing morally wrong. Uh, oh, and I was gonna say, right? Maybe it is. It's funny. Usually, I get one or two hands in a class this size. Three or four hands will go up, maybe. And maybe those people normally would raise their hands in this. Maybe they're shy versions of those. You know, they're shy and don't want to raise your hand. But right, it's 